Welcome to the ninth episode of Tokyo Alumni Podcast. Today, our guest graduated St. Mary's in 2005. He then attended UBC in Canada, where he graduated in 2009. And upon graduation, he spent five months in Zambia, Africa, where he volunteered building houses with Habitat and Humanity. Following this experience, he moved back to Japan to learn Japanese in a language school for a year, and he had an internship at Price Waterhouse Coopers in Human Resources. It is during this experience that his love for all things of HR developed. Currently, he works as a senior talent acquisition professional at Cisco Systems. He has spent three years with Cisco in London and has been back with the company in Tokyo for just over a year now. He enjoys working through talent-related challenges. Um, welcome to the episode, Tom. Yeah, thanks, thanks for, uh, for having me. Yeah, thank you for being on. So today, I think the big focus is going to be what you're good at, which is HR, recruitment. And um, although obviously this is very ali- not alien, but it's different from my field of education, I've always been interested in things of like what companies look at in regards to CV, you know, how do they compare educational experience versus real life, you know, work experience. So hopefully questions like that is going to be answered as well as um, we can talk maybe a bit about how coronavirus has affected the whole landscape of recruitment and people getting jobs. Um, so let's just jump right into um, HR. If maybe we can hear from you, like why, why HR, right? There's so many different areas of business to go into. Um, why go into human resources? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question, Nick. I think, um, I think you know, back in uh, University of British Columbia, so I spent some time in Vancouver for four years there. And um, I think I was in my third year at the time. And I was a little bit, I wouldn't say lost per se, but I think I was a little bit unsure about what I wanted to do after graduation. So, you know, back then we had a HR club, kind of a biz you know, club that, you know, people could become a part of if they were interested in HR. Um, there wasn't a specific degree for HR at my university, but, um, you know, I was uh, something that I was looking at online a lot, like looking at different areas I wanted to go into. And I was coming across a lot of like HR stuff and, you know, different uh, websites that were showing some more information about it. So I started to kind of um, think more about like, hmm, well, what is that actually going to be like? What is, what is HR? And I started to sort of do some more research and I joined this club in university. And, you know, that allowed me to kind of meet people that were also interested in it at the time and, you know, get a little bit more information about what it actually is. And, you know, HR is kind of an interesting field because it's a combination of so many different things. There's psychology involved. There's, um, you know, an edu- there's actually an education piece to it as well. There's things like planning involved. There's obviously a business side to it because essentially what HR is doing is it's supporting other business functions that are a bit more frontline. So it's a little bit more of a support business group that you'll often find in companies. So that kind of interested me. Obviously, there's very much a people focus with HR as well. And, you know, to avoid a cliche, I, I do consider myself to be a little bit of a people person as well. But um, no, I kind of, it kind of spawned from that really. And then, you know, I think the internship that I did at PricewaterhouseCoopers in Japan kind of opened my eyes up a little bit with HR. And I kind of like really saw, okay, this is what it's actually like. This is, um, you know, what the day today looks like with HR. And I spent a lot of time with a lot of like bright people and, you know, learned a huge amount and cycled through some, HR teams, like you mentioned earlier, and, and really got to know like what it is. Um, got mentored by a few people at the company as well, and I kind of you know looked up to these people quite highly. Um, and it kind of started from there, really. And then you know I uh, um, did a master's in HR back in two thousand about two thousand eleven, I think. Um, and then like studied more HR stuff and, you know, uh, did a work placement as well at the time. So yeah, just kind of getting more ingrained with it. Um, and then kind of moved into recruiting, which is obviously a part of HR and, um, yeah, that's sort of where the, the, you know, the story kind of started, I guess. Say so, yeah, almost your entire career in HR. So, um, I'm sure you have a lot of stories from, your various experiences dealing with recruitment. And um, before we get into those stories, let's start with sort of the topic, the hot topic at the moment, which is COVID-19, right? We see unemployment at, I believe, um, at least for the under 25 age, the 18 to 25, we're talking about 25% plus unemployment rate in the States. I'm not sure what it is in Japan, but I imagine it's something comparable. 
Yeah, so I think um, I have the, the privilege to be working across different markets right now. So sometimes I do a lot of US-based hiring. I do APJC hiring. Uh, I obviously worked in London for about three years with my company, Cisco, right now. So I've, I've kind of seen it all, I guess. Um, I think it feels a little bit more hard hit in the US. I think the unemployment rates are just have skyrocketed. I think Japan has actually been, funnily enough, I think fairly stable. Um, it's not been hit too badly. Um, I think a, you know, the retail space has been hit pretty hard. The travel industry has been hit pretty hard as well. And the um, um, uh, hospitality space has been pretty hit hard as well. So IT, I think, has been able to kind of ride the wave a little bit because I think that the technology is generally designed to be off-premise um, and designed, you know, a lot of the time to be cloud-based. So, you know, we've in particular been able to ride that wave, I think, pretty well. But then, you know, some of the customers that we have in the travel space and the hospitality space, you know, the amount of layoffs that you see from like Airbnb to, um, you know, uh, other, you know, smaller boutique places um, that are in the travel space as well. You see across Europe, Lufthansa, airline companies are laying people off by the day. So, you know, for certain people in the workforce, I think it's really um, uh, been a problematic time. But um, you know, I think IT has ridden it pretty well. Um, I think, you know, the, the flexibility for IT in particular to be able to work from home has definitely helped. There are some companies in Japan, I think specifically, where working from home is, is virtually impossible because it's just not been in the work practice for a lot of Japanese companies to be working from home. So you often find like a lot of people, you know, still riding on the train, even through COVID-19 in Japan, which is, you know, a little bit, uh, a little bit dangerous maybe, but, um, you know, it's, it's been a bit more difficult for Japanese companies. So I think adjust to the, to the work from home environment. And I think a lot of companies have been able to, um, you know, benefit from that, particularly from an IT perspective. So even companies like Zoom, uh, and, you know, we're using it right now, right? Yeah. So, so, you know, you, you obviously seeing a lot of companies that are teleworker focused that are doing very well right now, like Zoom, um, even our Cisco WebEx product is doing incredibly well in the market right now. And then you're seeing other kind of um, uh, cloud-based solutions as well that are doing really well. So um, I think it depends on the industry you're coming from and you're working in. Um, so in these times where so much is going on online, so much of it's remote, I imagine interviews are being conducted more online. There's probably a lot more Zoom interviews or whatever interface people use. What kind of advice would you have towards people who are interviewing with potential future employers in an online platform? Yeah, I think that's a good question. I think, um, you know, we've had to basically adjust all of our interviews pretty much overnight um, with a lot of the COVID-19 stuff. So I think the, um, I think I think it's challenging to be honest. I think a lot of people are not used to it. Um, we, you know, we've had to basically go from, you know, all of our interviews going to online or onboarding to go online you know, and a lot of people are not even having the opportunity to just meet people like they have to do it all virtually. Um, I think the things that I would probably suggest people to be to be considerate of is, you know, it is what it is. Like, I think, you know, it's not always going to be easy. I think it's going to be different. And I think, you know, um, a lot of people would just need to, to you know, try it and, and not be afraid of trying, you know, interviews in these kind of circumstances. Um, I think a lot of it is also about um, so I think, you know, naturally people are going to get more and more comfortable with them. Um, and it also gives people the opportunity as well to, you know, you don't necessarily have to be on video sometimes as well. You can also do things over, over audio, which people may be equally comfortable with as well. So, yeah, I think it's, I, I'm not sure if I have a great answer to that question, but I think overall, I think just, just being aware that everybody's experiencing this the same way, you know, and, and tr trying to prepare for it as much as you can um, by, you know, uh, spending time with friends, family, and just getting more used to it. Because I think this is something that people just haven't been used to doing in the past. Um, and it, it may be the way that we go forward with. It may be something that we end up implementing a little bit more because of social distancing and things like that. So, yeah, I mean, that's, that's probably what I suggest there is just to, just to get yourself more used to it, really. So speaking of interviews, what would you say uh, would be your main, maybe like, uh, what, what would be something that you, when you talk to people in general, 
uh, that you've noticed is a major misconception people have about inter- the interview process? Think about the, the, the job that you're applying for and try to think about what you're trying to achieve by doing that job and having a good idea of picturing a little bit about, let's say you get the job, what are you aiming to do in your first 30, 60, 90 days of becoming an employee? We're asking that a lot of, you know, types of those, you know, questions like that in our interview process right now. Um, A lot of the questions that I think we're asking are designed to be both based on your current experience. So what, for example, you have done to date in your current role or past roles, and also asking theoretical questions around if you were given this role tomorrow, how would you approach a given situation? Um, let me give you an example of that. So um, let's say, for example, um, you know, uh, we have a like a position. Let's say I'm going to just throw out a position here, and I'm going to say customer success. And customer success is is a position that's based on, you know, um, someone that's able to manage client relationships, someone that's able to um, be able to field questions and answers from customers, and be able to be that that window. Um, for a customer into a given company. So we typically hire this type of role quite regularly. So the types of questions that we'd be asking um, would be focused on, you know, let's say a customer is angry with the product. Let's say the customer is not happy with the service they're being given. How would you look to bring that customer back on side? What kind of steps would you take? So a lot of the time it's, um, getting a window into someone's thought process and and sort of how they're thinking about things that may come up in the workplace. Um, And that gives us an opportunity to really know how someone is going to act in the job. So I think one of the common misconceptions is a lot of people may just do, you know, I need to learn about what the company do, which I think is just a basic fundamental of, you know, applying for a job is you should know, what do the company do? What industry do they work in? Who are their customers? Um, you know, maybe what their values are. Look them up on YouTube. At least have a f- familiarity with their basic product lines. But also, I think a lot of people would probably think, well, you know, they're probably going to ask me just about my experience. They're just going to ask me, you know, very kind of rudimentary questions. When I think a lot of the interview processes that I see, not only from us, but I think from other companies as well, are very dynamic and. You know, I think being prepared for, you know, being asked multiple different types of questions that are both theoretical and sort of based on some of the experience you've had today. So when it comes to um, th- these interviews, the styles are quite different depending on the country. I remember, uh, so I worked in Japan. I, actually, we, we might have even been in the same company at the same time, or I think I was there maybe a little before you um, for PricewaterhouseCoopers. When I prepared for Japanese companies, they were telling me about this apaku mensetsu, right? Like the high pressure interviews. Do how different are those styles today? It, has it changed at all? Because at least from what I hear, the comp- the companies in Japan are you know sort of quote unquote becoming more westernized. There's less of this like really intense like no smiling the whole interview. And are they becoming more friendly? And has that landscape changed the past decade or two? Yeah, I think I think it has to some extent. Um, I think it depends on the type of company though. I think it depends on the environment Are they, you know, a very Westernized company versus a very traditional style company. So like a Maru Benny, for example, may have a slightly different feel in an interview than let's say like a Sony, which is a little bit more like perhaps dynamic, um, you know, and what I typically see in Japanese interviews is obviously very much a focus on uh, fitting into the group. So I think a lot of, hiring managers would focus on, is this person going to cause me any problems? Is this person going to stick out? You know, it's that, you know, that they uh, typically, you know, in Japan, there's a saying, right, where you, um, you hammer in the nail that gets, that sticks out. So I think a lot of Japanese companies will kind of focus on that type of questioning throughout the process. I think a lot of it is um, focusing on sort of the work ethic people would have as well in Japanese companies. Are they willing to go the extra mile for the group and the company? Are they willing to put the hours in? Are they willing to, you know, um, put themselves out a little bit as well? 
I think a lot of it is also a lot of body language stuff that, you know, comes up in a lot of Japanese interviews where it's like, do you have a straight posture? Um, do you, you know, um, how, how polished do you look? You know, is your suit black, particularly when it comes to new graduate hiring? There's very formulaic and very um, specific things that people are looking out for. If you come in with a, with a red suit or anything like that, I think it would probably raise a few eyebrows. Um, so I think that's still in place. I think, it, again, it depends on the company, it depends maybe on the industry that they're working in. Um, I think typically you're seeing a lot more startups in Japan these days, which I think is then bringing about a little bit more of a casualized dress code, um, more of a tendency on, you know, um, uh, focusing on wanting to hire employees that are more creative. Um, I think Japanese companies traditionally have not really wanted to hire people that are too creative. I think they've wanted to focus on people that are more process driven and focusing on sort of, you know, making sure that they get everything done from A to B and, and being a little bit more risk averse with the hiring that they go through. They don't want to hire somebody that may be perceived to be a little bit uh, of a maverick too much. Um, so yeah, I think uh, it, it's changing a little bit, but I think it definitely depends on the industry. And I think with the, the you know the focus on startups these days, and I think Japan is becoming slowly, particularly Tokyo, a mini hub for startups, which I think is is bringing about different hiring practices for the better. Yeah, that's really interesting about the the difference in in cultures impacting the interviewing process. So speaking of the interviewing process, I'm sure you've seen your fair shares of CVs or I guess Americans are calling resumes. I call them resumes, but I have enough uh, British friends. I started calling them CVs because it's right. shorter. <laughs> but um, I guess there's a few things I want to touch upon with CVs. The first would be um, kind of similar with the interview question. You, when you, you've seen a bunch of CVs, what, what are the most common mistakes people make? And also what is like one easy fix that people can do when it comes to writing their own CVs? Yeah, so there's, a, there's kind of a, an adage in recruiting, right, where um, typically a recruiter will look at a CV no longer than 30 seconds, you know, so you've basically got 30 seconds to try and impress someone that's seeing your CV, let's say. So um, I, I think, you know, given the fact that I've worked in many different regions, I guess, so I worked in the EMEA market, which is Europe, Middle East, Africa, for about three years, I've worked in the APJC region, which is Asia Pacific, China, Japan. I've worked US market as well, um, and obviously J Japan. Japan is incredibly distinct, I think. You know, you're seeing the regular direct shows and shokume direct shows, which are, you know, you're obviously, you're having two documents that you're sending to a company. One of them is, you know, designed to just show basic information about yourself and a picture where you live your age and things like that. Whereas the Shokume Kirek show is very much focused on what you've done today. So I think the biggest difference with Japan and the rest of the world is the fact that generally speaking, you'll have two documents and even sometimes a third document where you have an Avon CV, which is the, you know, the English sort of version of, of both of those documents. Right. But I think, you know, it's, it's kind of interesting because, you know, I've worked those different markets. I think in, in a, you know, uh, in the EMEA region, particularly when it comes to, you know, I used to sometimes see French CVs. French CVs would typically have huge amounts of bells and whistles on them. And what I mean by that is, like, a lot of people focus on putting on putting icons in their CV, like company icons, like logos. A huge wow. emphasis on putting a logo in the CV. I think it's, a, it's an attempt to try and draw attention to the resume of the CV to say, look where I've worked. I've worked in such and such a place. It's a little bit more of a elitist mindset, I think, over there. And I think a lot of the, you know, the schools that you'll have around Paris or around different parts of France are very um, prestigious and people, you know, want to show the schools they went to. And, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a specific mindset attached to that. Um, I think in the IT space, you'll typically see a lot of people that are very skills focused as well, which I think is interesting. And I think, um, you know, people are very heavy on using um, specific certifications. So it's very much a certification based industry. So what you what you learn and what you um, what edge, you know, what kind of outside education you've done outside of university is highly desirable. Um, 
The problem, I think, with a lot of IT CVs is the fact that a lot of people will have trained and done these certifications, but they would typically just, what I would describe as dump them, which is mm. they would maybe do the certification, but they won't really know how to implement anything they've learned from that particular training. So an IT CV typically is very difficult to decipher if someone is actually a good candidate for a job until you've asked them very specific technical questions. And sometimes you'll have to jump on the phone with them and ask them more about what they've done and if it relates very well to the job in which they're applying for. Um, you know, and I, I think typically in terms of tips, I think going back to your second point, I think in terms of tips, I would definitely say trying to keep it as polished as you can. Don't make your CV or resume any longer than a page or two because if it becomes a book, there's just, you know, nobody's going to want to read that, that amount of text. Um, it also, you're being evaluated on your ability to be concise. And if you're showing a CV or sending in a CV that's like, like more than five pages, I think that that's probably going to be flagged up a little bit. Um, I think the formatting is incredibly important. I would suggest looking at good formatting online. There's a bunch of different resources, I think, that you can look at for good formatting online and using a template there. Um, you know, and I think, you know, there's a lot of uh, websites that specialize in this as well. So I definitely suggest uh, use, using a resource like that. Yeah, and, and obviously, like, the, the, the things that come to mind are, you know, making sure that you've got your most relevant experience at the top. You don't want to make, you know, someone read five pages and get to the bottom of it to know, like, what you've been recently doing. You know, and the, the, the interesting thing about resumes and CVs is there's obviously cultural implications. Like, in the U.S., for example there is a very high degree of, of privacy involved in a CV. You can't put your address on a CV or you shouldn't be putting your address on your CV. You can't be putting a picture on your CV, which is generally normal in Japan. Um, you, you know, you shouldn't be putting anything, you know, related to, you know, religious affiliations, political stuff. Um, that's generally considered to be kind of off limits. Um, and, you know, even as recruiters, we actually have our own sort of, um, rules and norms where we shouldn't be making uh, the wrong assumptions about people based on the information that we're looking at on the CV. So if someone has volunteered a picture, we shouldn't be then putting them in an interview process because of the way they look and things like that. So um, yeah, I think that's kind of interesting. And you see different, different things that happen in different um, regions. Um, I think the U S is, is very much, um, you know, compliant, for, for things like that. Whereas other locations like Japan are a little bit less, you know, uh, focused on like, um, uh, you know, people having particular biases about things. That, yeah, that, that, um, I think it's a, it's actually illegal, right. In the States to have a picture on the resume. Yeah, exactly. And that, yeah, that's always been a point that I've found incredibly intriguing. Um, how in Japan you, you still do put the photos on and um, yeah, with, with CVs, I was also hoping to ask you, what are some examples of like the most outrageous CVs you've seen and, and what made it outrageous? Oh, you know, it's, it's, it's like the colors. Some people put like pink CVs or like, you know, there's CVs that are like, are, are so like multicolored that it's so loud and in your face that you're just like, Oh my God. Like, I just don't want to look at this resume or CV. It's just like, just, just, you know, it's so loud and so like out there that it's just, um, like bordering on strange, to be honest. I think typically what you'll see is in the marketing space or the, you know, the creative industries, you'll see some pretty, very interesting formatted CVs that are typically like, you know, maybe they've got flowers on them. They've got like, you know, different wallpaper that's like striped wallpaper on the CV or like, you know, some stuff like, um, you know, like some Formula One type CV that have got cars all over them. You can tell that someone likes Formula One quite a bit. Um, but uh, yeah, I think those are probably some of the most outrageous things I think I've seen on CVs. Um, but again, like I should, you know, I don't want to be making an assumption on someone. So you've got to be a bit careful with, you know, drawing too many conclusions on someone, you know, based on the CV they're giving you. Recruiters have 30 seconds. You want to leave a strong impression. But let's say you have left that strong impression and now they're maybe spending, you know, your 
resume moves through the ranks. They're spending maybe more than 30 seconds. Um, at the end of most resumes, I've seen people include their hobby, including myself, although I haven't had to uh, hunt for jobs now for a while. Um, and one thing I've always been a bit confused about or unsure about is um, to what degree does that even matter? Is, is that just like a formality or is there ever a, a time where uh, I, maybe you're aware that I'm, I'm quite into football? Right? I played and like it's, it's in my like at the end, it's like, oh, I like, you know, I like I like football. I like soccer. Does that ever play a big role? Um, are there any examples where that someone was? Yeah, like, yes. <laughs> that's a that's a that's a good question. I think, and I think um, there's actually a bunch of studies on this type of topic. To be honest, Nick, I think like there's a lot of stuff that's around. People generally want to hire people that are similar to themselves. Um, you will generally gravitate towards the interests that you have, and someone having the same interests as you, and you kind of build up that bond that way. Um, I, th I think it gets used in interview processes. I think it's a talking point. I think it's also an icebreaker that a lot of people use in order to kind of build rapport with someone. So, you know, typically we may find people like for our company, we may find people that like games. So if you've got games written on your resume and we could, we happen to have a lot of people that like games in our, um, company. So, um, Sorry, there's a little bit of background noise that you're, you're hearing. Uh, that's no problem. Um, but I guess if it's probably going to go away like in three seconds, yeah. So I'll edit yeah. that out. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so basically you're seeing a lot of, um, you're seeing a lot of, I think, questions that can easily come up in interviews around people's interests and shared interests. Typically, we're telling people that because we're a California based company and California is probably the most progressive state in the whole of the U S when it comes to, you know, unconscious bias and things like that, that we shouldn't be necessarily trying to hire people that have the same interests as us, because then you're lacking diversity in the workplace. You'll be hiring the same people all the time. Um, and, you know, what we're trying to put forward is that we're trying to hire people that are different from ourselves. It's really hard, though. It's actually really hard. I mean, who doesn't want to hire somebody just like themselves? I think most people would, right? So it's actually a challenge that I think we as recruiters face, you know, very, um, you know, very, you know, frequently, right? You, people that we're talking to, we may naturally, unconsciously be talking to people that are very similar to ourselves and we may be putting forward people that are very similar to ourselves. So it's diff it's something that's difficult to, to get away from, but I think you should be aware of it. And I think you should be aware of maybe when you're doing it so that you can take a step back and think, wait a second, am I really like putting this person forward because I think they're the best person for this job? Or am I putting them forward because I have similar interests to them? And I tell that to hiring managers all the time. So we've spoken quite a bit about HR, recruitment, sort of businessy type of things, but it is Tokyo Alumni Podcast. So is there anything you would want to share about your time at Tokyo at St. Mary's International School? I went to St. Mary's from 2000 and 2005. I had a, you know, a great experience. I think it was a, a massive adjustment. I think at the time I, uh, I came from this like small town and, you know, Northeast London, that was like an hour outside London and went to a really regular school. And then, you know, suddenly my family got moved over to Japan and, you know, Tokyo and, you know, there was an adjustment to St. Mary's, there was adjustment to just living in Japan and just seeing stuff that I felt was weird, like people wearing masks on the train, which is just something I'd never seen before. And it was like, Ooh, like this is, this is kind of weird. Um, but um, yeah, I think initially, I think it was a little bit tough, the adjustment. And I think a lot of people that moved to Tokyo, I think just generally go through that. You know, but I think a lot of people were, were welcoming, I think, to the, in the school. I think the teachers specifically were pretty welcoming as well. And I think the, you know, the education, I think, is uh, pretty, um, pretty solid at St. Mary's. I think, you know, in fact, you know, the, the education system I was coming from was, was pretty crap, to be honest. So to, to take that massive leap to go from like, you know, mediocrity to, to a place like St. Mary's, I think was, was definitely good, particularly for setting me up for, uh, you know, what was going to happen after school. Yeah. And I think there was a big emphasis. I think St. Mary's is like the, one of the best, I think, along with ASIJ and the Kanto Plains for sports. So strong set of sports groups, you know, I did wrestling, which kind of like stayed with me today. 
um, you know, a lot of that mindset you develop in, in, in the sports teams in high school is something that lives with you for quite some time. Um, but no, I think I had, you know, good fond memories of St. Mary's. I think, you know, the, 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 st the style of education and kind of the, the camaraderie, I think that you build through the sports teams was something that was super, um, super good. I think from, from St. Mary's as well. Yeah, that's, that's great to hear that the sports teams is something, you know, that stuck with you because I think myself being in the international school system, that's something they really pride. I think we have, for example, my school is about the same size, St. Mary's, SIJ. And I think we recently gathered some data that something like 80% of our kids like play at least one season of sports, which is like the antithesis of what you have in places like the US or Canada. So as we wrap up this conversation, I want to sort of finish it off with, I usually just sort of pass along the torch to the speaker for a few minutes to sort of um, talk about what is coming up in their lives, whether it's in a few months or in a few years or the next few decades, you know, what are the goals? And yeah, that's pretty much our last bit of the interview. So I'm going to go ahead and give you the mic. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I, don't, I don't think I have too much going on in my life in the next few months. I think a lot of it is trying to ride this wave of COVID-19 right now and try to you know, come out of it, you know, in, in a better situation and then sort of learn sort of, you know, spending so much time at home, spending so much time working from home. And like, I think a lot of that is, is kind of, change my mindset a little bit as well and I tr and I feel like there's a lot more time for me to think about what I want to do um and obviously continue doing what I'm doing right now is just trying to be you know obviously uh, a better uh you know HR talent professional all that type of thing but um but hey like if there's any of your listeners that would be interested in just having a chat about anything recruiting related I'm obviously open ears to that if they want to have a casual conversation about like you know um, how to get ahead in the, the, you know, the business world or the IT world, or just trying to get ahead in the job market. I'm, I'm open to having conversations with people as well. So, um, so yeah, that's, that's pretty much it for me, really. I mean, and, and thanks for having me today. Yeah. Thanks for coming and thanks for inviting, um, yeah, other alums and other international school students, uh, to get advice from you. Um, I'm actually going to be job hunting in a few years, so. Uh, I hope that includes me and uh, I may send you an email or two. For sure. Yeah, let me know. Definitely. So on that note, um, thank you for joining us for episode nine. That was Tokyo Alumni Podcast. Thank you for joining us, Tom. Thanks, Nick. Take it easy.